Chicago began rebuilding so quickly that the ground was still hot to the touch. The first load of lumber arrived the same day the fire was extinguished. But what surprised people is that there were businesses that opened on the day after the fire, selling things, food, blankets, anything. William Kerfoot, who claimed that his little wood shack was the first building in the burned area, ironically made out of wood and with a hand-painted sign that said, all gone but wife, children, and energy. Newspaperman William Brost had lost his home and belongings, but not his business. He and Joseph Medill continued to publish the Tribune from a makeshift office amidst the rubble. Just a day after the fire, the Chicago Tribune, its headline pronounces, Chicago will rise again. There's a sense that, you know, this, this fire can't stop us, that we are, we are destined to become even bigger and better of a city than we were before. Bross hopped a train to New York to convince financiers that Chicago was still a sound investment. He's a bullshitter. Uh, you know, he's unbelievable, but he's great on the stump. You know, he's making crazy predictions. People thought he was nuts. Chicago's going to have a million people by 1900, and he knows he has to promote it, particularly in New York City. Go to Chicago now. Young men, hurry there. Women, send your husbands. You will never again have such a chance to make money. Why would anybody come to a city that was totally destroyed by fire? Well, because it's a city of opportunity. It's a city of jobs. It's a city of, of places where you can come and start anew. The supposedly fireproof Palmer House Hotel lay in ruins. But it would soon be resurrected, thanks to the ingenuity of its architect. As the fire raged around him, John Van Osdo buried the hotel's blueprints in a basement hole encased in clay. When he later discovered the blueprints perfectly intact, he realized he'd stumbled on a way to fireproof his buildings. Van Osdo used the recovered plans and his new fireproof clay tiles to rebuild an even more lavish Palmer House. Though the fire leveled the north side and downtown, the city's grain elevators, lumber yards, and the Union stockyards were largely untouched. You couldn't take away Chicago's geography. It was still the gateway to the American West. It was, you know, its railroads weren't destroyed. It still had these lines of track that were going to deliver its commodities to the rest of the country and the rest of the world. Many of the city's banks were up and running from temporary offices within days. Though some bank vaults had melted, others were found intact. Donations poured in from around the country and the world. England sent thousands of books. Queen Victoria thought she was restoring Chicago's public library. The problem was, Chicago never had a library. What are you going to do with all of these books. There was an old iron water tank. What the city did was made that the first Chicago public library. The spirit of goodwill was not universal. Unscrupulous newspapermen fabricated tales of looting, lynchings, and murders that occurred during the fire. One reporter spun tales of villainous Negroes gliding through the masses like vultures in search of prey. He claimed hollow-eyed Irish women in bedroom slippers and torn dresses were moving here and there, stealing. You gotta blame this on somebody. They're looking for scapegoats as, it, as the city's burning. And the scapegoat in this case becomes the poor. And um, the overwhelming majority of deeply poor people in Chicago were Irish immigrants. With Chicago's aristocracy on edge, Mayor Roswell B. Mason moved to restore order. He banned liquor sales and imposed martial law. The mayor's friend, General Philip Sheridan, led troops into Chicago. City of Chicago is the first city after the Civil War to be occupied by the army. What does that say to immigrants? It says, watch yourself. We know you Irish. You Catholics are troublemakers. We don't want them running around crazy around the city, so we'll send the troops in. 
teach them their place. The sight of soldiers thrilled the Tribune's William Bross. I verily believe what was left of the city would have been nearly, if not quite entirely, destroyed by the cutthroats and vagabonds who flocked here, like vultures from every point of the compass. Mayor Mason turned over recovery efforts to an organization run by the city's Protestant elite. The Chicago Relief and Aid Society raised $5 million for medical care, food, water, and clothing. It also gave skilled laborers the means to house their families. You could qualify for a kit that you could build your own relief cottage. And it was all the materials you'd need of wood to build this compact little temporary wood structure that would give you safe shelter that could get you through the winter. But the elites who ran the relief efforts were quicker to help some than others. Who do we help? How do we help them? Who would we like to go away? Ah, who would we like to go away? Well, those damn Irish, those damn Catholics, if they just moved out of the city, we'd be all a lot happier. 30,000 Chicagoans abandoned their city on free railroad passes. The hardship fell largely on the working poor. They had not only lost their loved ones, homes and belongings, but often lacked insurance and key documents like property records. We were too generous, the argument was, in allowing the Irish to throw up these shanties, which are fire traps. We're gonna remove these people. So the Irish get pushed out further, and then they set up Mrs. O'Leary. 